media psychology. That's the name of a new discipline or paradigm aroused in the field of communication. Within the Department of Communication at Pompeu Fabre University, we have started to work in this area, which is well spread throughout the United States, but still emerging in Europe and Spain. And that's the scope of this video, to boost the knowledge about media psychology. But let's start from the beginning. What is media psychology? Let's think about what happens to our body when we see an appetizing burger on our computer screen. We'll probably begin to salivate. Also a kiss makes our heart beat faster, or the sound of a sudden move while listening to a football game on the radio makes our hands sweat. We're more and more exposed to different inputs coming from different media, communication media, internet or social media. Images, sounds, smells, shapes and movements received through all kinds of media messages in an increasingly digital and complex environment. The problem is that our brain's ability to process them is quite limited. That means we can process too many information at a time. Therefore, we are forced to select only those inputs that are relevant. Our brain has to filter out all the inputs we don't need and keep those that are relevant to give meaning to and survive in the world we live. The questions we need to ask are, how does it do it? How does our brain work, react, and process all these media messages? Luis Mas, researcher at UPF, explains the origins. To answer all these questions, and on the basis of the increasing influence that technology already had on communication, a new field of psychology emerged in the 80s, media psychology. In the late 80s, the American Psychological Association founded the Media Psychology Division, Division 46, with emphasis on media influence research. The idea was to understand how technology influenced human behavior. Thus, media psychology is the scientific study linking psychological knowledge with the way people interact with technology-mediated messages. The outcome shows that in the last years there is a special focus on ethics, advertising, marketing, art, news, behavior, gender, identity, politics, education, narrative and health. Thus, generally speaking, the scope of this paradigm is quite varied. It can focus on the message and dig into different topics, health, politics, different genres, advertisement, news, or different media, television, radio, internet, or focus on the kind of processing and so analyzing behavior, cognition, or emotions. In this particular research about the popular topics of media psychology, the most mentioned media was television, but recently, there is a special focus on video games and social networks. Using psychophysiological measures is not a new thing. Psychophysiology is a consolidated discipline halfway between psychology and physiology. However, what's new is using psychophysiological methods to measure response to communication processes, especially when they are technologically mediated. One of the researchers working in this field Professor Paul Bowles from the Center for Communication Research at Texas Tech University clarifies what media psychology is. Media psychology is the scientific study of how individuals perceive, mentally process, and are potentially influenced by media content and technology. Another leading researcher of the field, Robert Porter, from the Institute for Communication Research at Indiana University delves into the conceptualization of media psychology. Media psychology takes what we know from a very established field of psychology and applies it to how human beings interact with mediated messages. So essentially, I like to think of it as looking at how embodied brains interact with a mediated environment and then a variety of different definitions of what a mediated environment is come into play. So some people think that this, you and I are having a mediated discussion right now even though it's face to face. 
that the media is air and light. But most researchers in media psychology seem to focus in on some sort of electronic mediation, whether it's film or television or music or radio or what have you. So. Research in the field has evolved gradually, thanks in part to the publication of a journal with the same name, Media Psychology. This journal is indexed within the branch of communication. Several courses based on this emerging discipline, especially master degrees, had been created. Furthermore, a number of labs has been established to further investigate the cognitive processing of media messages. According to Professor Bowles, rather than a discipline, media psychology can be regarded as a paradigm. Well, I think this, uh, this approach of media psychology is actually more of a, a paradigm uh, for research within the field of communication. I think it's a terrific organizing um, scientific paradigm for approaching research on media. I think this, uh, this, this, when you view media psychology as a paradigm rather than, which I think it is, rather than a sub-discipline of communication, um, I think that that's where it has its real importance is in providing all the things that come with a scientific paradigm, which is a, a a, a great way of organizing important research questions about a phenomenon, um, a collection of validated measures and, and, um, and, and reliable and valid, valid um, approaches to data analysis um, and, and just um, 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 training and mentoring of scholars in a community all centered around investigating this phenomenon of, again, how people are perceiving, processing, and potentially influenced by media. A research conducted by Baker Derwin and Dimerode in 2013 analyzed the most popular topics of the Media Psychology magazine between 1999 and 2010. The outcome shows that in the last years there is a special focus on ethics, advertising, marketing, art, news, behavior, gender, identity, politics, education, narrative, and health. Thus, generally speaking, the scope of this paradigm is quite varied. It can focus on the message and dig into different topics, health, politics, different genres, advertisement, news, or different media, television, radio, or internet. Or focus on the kind of processing and so analyzing behavior, cognition, or emotions. In this particular research about the popular topics of media psychology, the most mentioned media was television. Even if most recently there is a special focus on video games and social networks. Many studies have tried to analyze in a more specific way the structural elements of media messages. That is the subject matter of some American labs, such as the Prime Lab, now Media Brain Lab at Missouri University, the Center for Communication Research at Texas Tech University, or the Institute for Communication Research at Indiana University. The uh, Prime Lab is focused on fundamentally understanding the phenomenon of how people interact with, perceive, process, and respond to all kinds of media content and technology, basically how the brain um, responds, you know, processes and responds to um, media interactions. Um, we, see, we, uh, um, we define that very broadly um, in, terms of, um, in terms of the kinds of data that we collect to um, observe um, that process of perceiving and processing responding to media, and we also uh, uh, take a very um, mind-centered, broad definition to even what media content and technology is um, in terms of uh, moving beyond traditional definitions of media as, you know, technological box like television and, um, and so forth, to really trying to adopt this brain-focused conceptual definition of even what media and media exposure 
in the lab. So the, the ICR is actually a, a shared research facility for the media school at Indiana University. And so um, it's home for a wide variety of different types of communication research. So uh, my job is to make sure that there's space and uh, capabilities for what everybody wants to do. And we do everything from my work looks at processing of, of sound and, and audio in mediated messages. And, uh, but there's a, a wide variety of video game research that goes on here. Uh, some people are looking at uh, moral uh, action and uh, how moral agency in video games. There's uh, people who are looking at um, food advertisements and how uh, food uh, advertisements can actually tap into the motivation systems that we talked about uh, have evolved in human beings. And so it's not that the media is controlling you to eat certain foods, but there are ways of activating these uh, really ingrained motivation systems in us based on how you put a, an ad together, for example. Uh, there are people uh, looking at uh, the use of personal devices and how attached we feel to personal devices and how uh, the, the, the cell phones, for example, can actually alienate others in a room or ostracize others in a room if they don't feel like they're a part of the communication that's going on. Uh, we have people who are looking at sex and gender roles in video games. Uh, we have people looking at, boy, we have a lot going on. We, we have people looking at um, the processing of same-sex uh, couples in advertising, which has been something that in the U.S. market at least has uh, recently happened, and how that's perceived and how that affects the perception of the ad and the brand itself. So there's a whole bunch that's going on here. As we've seen, there is a wide range of application. In the case of television, variables such as camera changes and movements had been studied. In the case of radio, changes on the type of voice, music, and sound effects. And in the case of web, animation or emotional images. At UPF, thanks to the financial help of European Union's Marie Curie funds, we've extended these studies to prosody. That means that our job is to find out which is the most effective way of modulating the voice and using the accent and the rhythm while speaking to improve attention and recall of the messages. The outcome of this research is very useful for those people who do public speaking, since it provides strategies to draw the attention of the audience and to increase the comprehension of the information. All these studies are framed by the limited capacity model of motivated mediated message processing theory, which is one of the most influencing theories in the field and the one we work on at UPF. This theory was later called Dynamic Human Centered Communication System Theory and represents a theoretical approach to the cognitive processing of information model. This theory focuses on the study of attention and memory of the listeners exposed to messages from communication media. This model was created by Annie Lang from Indiana University in Bloomington, United States. This researcher understands the link between human mind and media content as a dynamic interaction varying according to the level of motivation of the human being. Let's listen to her. It's basically a theory that tries to provide a general explanation for how information gets out of media into people's brains. And media is a variable in the theory, not uh, it's variable. So, and, and the theory tries to identify things about media that are common, that are psychologically relevant 
and could occur in multiple medias. The novelty, relevance, or attractiveness of the message guides the attention and makes it easier to select which part of the message will be processed. Motivation is the key. Like, so one of the predictions of LC4MP is that if something's motiv motivationally relevant and it's important to the message, right, and it's um, on screen a long time, then you should remember it really well. But you don't. We have empirical evidence that you don't. In fact, those things are remembered very poorly, but how could they be? Because how could you have understood the story and gotten and had the motivational response and all that, but not remember it. Does that make any sense at all? No, but we know. Oh, we've got the empirical. So this is like a really cool thing, right? And, and the answer that I am putting forward, which was just published in Human Communication Research, but moment to moment changes in motivational activation, then I need a measure of motivational activation. And since I don't think any of this stuff is conscious, I'm not going to ask people what they're doing unless I want to know what they think. Right, so I'm not going to ask you, did your motivational system activate? Because you don't know. But I will ask you, how'd you feel? Because you do know that. You can tell me that. And that's the result of all these other things coming together. And it's a useful thing to know because the, the labels we give to how our feel, we feel are the states that our bodies are capable of, of taking on. And, and they're interesting to know about. But, but how the, the, the peripheral an autonomic physiology that underlies those states, that's interesting too, if we, if we can learn what those are. And then if you know which things in media influence those things, you could bring about states more easily or more accurately, perhaps. To measure this cognitive processing, there are two different methods, psychophysiology and cognitive analysis. We will focus on psychophysiology, which is the methodology we use at UPF. Using psychophysiological measures is not a new thing. Psychophysiology is a consolidated discipline halfway between psychology and physiology. However, what's new is using psychophysiological methods to measure response to communication processes, especially when they are technologically mediated. The main advantage of psychophysiology applied to communication is that it allows to recall live data of the individual's response while being exposed to media messages. So we won't ask the subject whether she or he was focused on the message or not, or how the message impacted on his or her emotions, but rather will measure different psychophysiological responses that we identify as an indicators of attention and emotion. You know, psycho, you know, psychophysiology is much more than just a collection of measures that record nervous system activity um, as an individual or participant in an experiment interacts with some kind of media content or technology, but rather you know, psychophysiology um, provides, again, everything that a scientific paradigm ought to provide, which is ways of defining the phenomenon, you know, like, you know, ways of specifically defining and identifying the important aspects of the phenomenon, like the fact that the, like, that the mind is embodied, meaning that, you know, it makes sense to record, say, heart rate as a measure of cognitive resources allocated to encoding. Um, skin conductance as a measure of arousal, um, and you know, the list obviously goes on with the different specific psychophysiological measures. Brain is an embodied organ in a human uh, being, and so these psychological states that we find ourselves in when we experience media can be measured using um, how the body reacts. So I uh, use heart rate, for example, as a measure of cognitive effort. So rather than asking someone how much attention they paid to media, um, or rather only, rather than only doing that, we do ask them how much attention they paid to the media, but then we also will measure their heart rate while they experience the media message. And we can use uh, uh, the changes in that measure to see how much attention is being paid. We look at uh, facial muscle, muscle, facial muscle changes 
uh, to look at uh, positivity and negativity. Uh, so above the, the eyebrow, we measure the corrugator muscle for uh, negative affect. Um, we use the under the eye as a measure of positive affect. So uh, if, I like to tell my students that if, if someone you know, fake smiles at you, then this looks like a smile, but what's missing is this um, under the eye, and so we can actually get at true positive affect that way. Uh, and then we measure um, excitement or agitation or arousal in the sympathetic nervous system using skin conductance. So we measure that off the palm of the hand, or sometimes off the, the sole of the foot if uh, the hands are busy doing uh, playing video games or typing on a keyboard or what have you. Uh, recently we've started to measure uh, brainwave activity, so EEG, um, to look at uh, a, more of a central measure. So those measures I mentioned earlier are more peripheral, so they're farther down the nervous uh, system, the, the central nervous system chain. So we're getting closer to the, ner the, the source, the brain, and uh, we've recently started to for example, look at how people respond to um, messages in an online discussion, so a chat room essentially, and if uh, the, the, the piece of text that comes up uh, supports an idea that you have, uh, whether you have a different brain response than if the text comes up and disagrees with the initial position that you have. So um, those are, are, are some of the first looks directly into the brain measures that, that we're doing in the lab. Mm -hmm. The most common physiological parameters measured in these labs are skin conductance, heart rate, and facial muscle movement through electromyography. First, the electrodermal activity, also called skin conductance or galvanic skin response, indicates the level of emotional activation to a message or arousal. It's measured by recording the activity of the eccrine glands situated on the surface of the palm of the hand. Consequently, in this case, the electrodes are placed on the participant's palm of the hand. Even though it can also be measured on the palm of the foot in case the subject has his or her hands busy. This variable is used to measure the level of activation of response as well as the cognitive effort, motivation and attention to messages with different degrees of complexity. Secondly, heart rate is the main physiological measurement or heart activity. It's measured by an electrocardiogram, which determines the heart beats per minute. Functionally, the heartbeat is measured by placing three electrodes on the participant's arms. A slowdown in the heart rate is linked to the orientation reflex, to a guided response, an increase of attention. That guided response represents a face sympathetic response. It boosts the interaction with a new or relevant message. This response orients the attention towards the message and measures the cognitive effort made by an individual. A decrease in the heart rate in a period of five, seven seconds after the input indicates an increase of the cognitive effort and the attention. Thirdly, facial electromyography records the electric activity coming from the contractions of face muscular fibers. The most common fibers include those of the zygomatic muscle, the orbicularis muscle, and the corrugator muscle. The zygomatic is placed on the upper part of the cheek and its activation indicates a positive emotional response. Thus, if someone fakes a smile, their mouth could make the gesture of a smile but the muscle could remain inactivated, like this. The orbicularis and corrugator muscles are located in the eyes. The orbicularis surrounds the eye and indicates a positive emotion. The corrugator is located 
over the nose between the eyebrows and its activation indicates a negative emotional response as when frowning. To measure the activity of these muscles, two electrodes must be placed on each of them, here and here. It's used to measure a message balance dimension, that is, the positive or negative assessment of the message by the individual. But the human being is so complex that it is more proper to measure its reactions to a message through different methods. According to Martinez, they can be categorized into four dimensions, feel, think, say, and do. Thus, the model could involve analyzing the emotional reaction, feelings, the human's cognition, thinking, and the behavioral attitudes, expressions, and actions. Research that's going to deliver the best on scientific validity and value is going to be research that takes more of a holistic approach to measuring the experience. Um, you know, even, you know, the discipline of psychology, the discipline in charge of understanding human nature um, has, you know, has basically categorized there being three distinct channels of data that are informative of human experience. Uh, the physiological channel, which has to do with psychophysiological measures, but also they're recognizing the importance of still asking people questions that a lot of human experience is embedded in, in uh, linguistic responses. And then, of course, obviously behavior. Um, that there are, you know, those three, that there are three important channels of data if you're going to understand human nature. There is undoubtedly still much work to do. In fact, there are still many variables of the message that need to be studied using this methodology. But media psychology and psychophysiological measures can provide a holistic and comprehensive approach in accordance with the progress on communication studies. Therefore, it's an amazing possibility for the scientific study of communication, which we are working on right now at Pompeo Fava University. If you need further information or you are interested in conducting any research, please don't hesitate to contact us to our email address. We are looking forward to your comments and suggestions. Thanks.